Welcome to the Deadly Addictions channel. Today I'm going to be talking about why friendship requires great communication. This podcast will probably be in the, I don't know, mental health, social media playlist, but it was something I wanted to talk about. Every once in a while, I do a deep dive, and it's sort of like me making believe I'm going to college for a certain subject. And I'll spend a couple of months, um, you know, treating it like it's something I have to do a couple of days a week, you know, and learn a little bit more. And sometimes it's for interest and curiosity with science things and, you know, NASA and like complicated things you want to get a grip on. And sometimes I read abstracts from um, some of these science things and I got to do deep dives. And I'll treat it as, oh, you know, why don't I spend two months uh, reading about this psychology thing? And if it's uh, about dealing with depression, anxiety, fear, you know, the whole thing and all the other types of interest. But sometimes it's personal growth. It's wanting to be a better person, be a better friend. And getting to the point here, I uh, there's a book. Um called Communication in the Real World, and it's more of an academic book. So when I read this chapter, it'll probably be word for word, like I do most articles. And maybe I'll interject here and there. Uh, But it's more of an academic dry read. And it might not be so entertaining, so fair warning, but it's it means a lot to me and how this chapter stands out. And there's so much nuance to friendship and relationships. And there's... You know, it's not always the blame game. It's not always who's wrong or who's right. It's sometimes accepting people for who they are. And even then it's a balance. What are they going through? What are you in the middle of? And recently, um, a friend of mine, it was a tragedy. And, um, you know, in, in reading about it and dealing with it and dealing with, you know, friends in general... Uh, you know, th- little things like a friend came over and um, I just wanted to tell them how much I loved them, give them a hug. And they felt weird and uncomfortable because I have my own problems and I have my own things I have to deal with. And some of those are in certain pod- podcasts I did, like the playlist on who is Joseph F. Olsis and, you know, who am I, I am I. And there's, you know, things that shape us to a certain extent. I like to describe it as, you know, you build up and learn skills to deal with things and move on and sometimes they are not really helpful later on so again this is going to be on uh, communication and friends that's the chapter again it's a academic book there's no author to give credit to and there's sections in here that give like little learning objectives and little things to test i might skip over that I just want to get to the general thing, have it out there as a podcast, and, you know, continue my deep dive, because this has more to do with just communication and friendship. It goes from a lot of things, like um, introduction to communication studies, communication and perception, verbal communication, nonverbal communication, listening, interpersonal communication process, communication in relationships, which is what I'm going to read, which is chapter 7, and it's point 2. And it goes on. You can get actually all the way up to, you know, in social media and the current times, technology and communication media. So it's a roundabout thing that could, you know, it helpful in a way where, you know, you have it as a bookmark or, you know, you download it, whatever. It's, again, it's for free here. And you can do a deep dive and maybe it'll help with your upcoming YouTube channel if you're going to try on learning communication and stuff. I did test when i first started i got like 300 videos now but when i first started i would do live tests and the most i ever went was like a little over six hours and i was testing my voice and whatever and i was trying to keep a standard type of show going meaning i didn't have to have people come into the chat on youtube and bring up subjects and talk to them although that was helpful but i wanted to you know every you know, 25 minutes or so, I would hit the, you know, what city I'm in, the temperature, the time, and, you know, go through stories. And anyway, so a book like this could help in general. But for now, the pressing concern for me is 
growing as a person, as a friend, uh, you know, accepting who I am, wh who other people are, and, you know, what are the, f you know, underlying foundations of it, and maybe this will help. So, in this chapter, it says communication and friends, it says the learning objectives. Compare and contrast different types of friendships. Describe the cycle of friendship from a formation to maintenance to dissolution, deterioration. Discuss how friendships change across, across the lifespan, from adolescence to later life. Explain how culture and gender influence friendships. So, like I said, I'll go through it. Um, not much interjection because it's a dry read. I'll try to get through it without flubbing up names and stuff. But, again, this is me, you know, trying to give the impression that... Um, Friendships require great communication, and I'll, I'll start now. Do you consider all the people you are friends with on Facebook to be friends? What's the difference, if any, between a Facebook friend and a real-world friend? Friendships, like other relationships forms, can be divided into categories. What's the difference between a best friend, a good friend, and an old friend? What about work friends, school friends, and friends of the family? It's likely that each of you reading this book has a different way of perceiving and categorizing your friendships. In this section, we will learn about the various ways we classify friends, the life cycle of friendships, and how gender affects friendships. Defining and Classifying Friends Friendships are voluntary Interpersonal relationships between two people who are usually equals and who mutually influence one another. Friendships are distinct from romantic relationships, family relationships, and acquaintances, are often described as more vulnerable relationships than others due to their voluntary nature. The availability of other friends and the fact that they lack the social and institutional support of other relationships. The lack of official support for friendships is not universal. Though, in rural parts of Thailand, for example, special friendships are recognized by a ceremony in which both parties swear devotion and loyalty to each other. Uh, there's a, there's a, high, a parenthesis here. Uh, Weisner and Adams, 1992, I guess it's a study, because this was put out in 2013. 2013. I'll continue. Even though we do not have a formal ritual to recognize friendships in the United States, in general, research shows that people have three main expectations for close friendships. A friend is someone you can talk to, someone you can depend on for help and emotional support, and someone you can participate in activities and have fun with. Uh, and then it says Rawlins, 1992. Although friendships vary across the lifespan, three types of friendships are common in adulthood. Reciprocal, associative, and receptive. Reciprocal friendships are solid interpersonal relationships between people who are equals with a shared sense of loyalty and commitment. These friendships are likely to develop over time and can withstand extreme changes such as geographic separation or fluctuations in other commitments such as work and childcare. Reciprocal friendships are what most people would consider the ideal for best friends. And that's... Uh, Pretty easy concept to understand. It's the main bulk of, you know, who I guess we all try to have as friends. All right, I'll continue. Uh, associative friendships are m m mutually pleasurable relationships between acquaintances or associates that, although positive, lack the commitment of reciprocal friendships. These friendships are likely to be maintained out of convenience or to meet instrumental goals. For example, a friendship may develop between two people who work at the same gym, who work out at the same gym. They may spend time with each other in this setting a few days a week for months or years. But their friendship might end if the gym closes or one's personal schedule changes. So that, that makes sense, right? Rece uh, receptive friendships include a status differential that makes the relationship asymmetrical. Unlike other friendship types that are between peers, this relationship is more like that of a supervisor-subordinate 
or clergy parishioner. In some cases, like a mentoring relationship, both parties can benefit from the relationship. In other cases, the relationship could quickly sour if the person with more authority begins to abuse it. A relatively new type of friendship, at least in the label, is the friends with benefits relationship. Friends with benefits, FB, FWB, relationships have the closeness of a friendship and the sexual activity of a romantic partnership without the expectations of romantic commitment or labels. Uh, Linda Mueller, Van Der Eft, and Kelly, 2011. FWB relationships are hybrids that combine characteristics of romantic and friend pairings, which produces some unique dynamics. In my conversations with students over the years, we have talked through some of the differences between friends, FWB, and hookup partners, or what we termed just benefits, hookup or just benefits. Relationships do not carry the emotional connection typical in a friendship. It may occur as one night stands or be regular things and exist solely for the gratification and or convenience of sexual activity. So why might people choose to have a, to have or avoid FWB relationships? <laughs> oh, that's funny. Various research studies have shown that half of the college students who participated have engaged in heterosexual FWB relationships, Bison and Levine, 2009. Many who engage in FWB relationships have particular views on love and sex, namely that sex can occur independently of love. Conversely, those who report no FWB relationships often cite religious, moral, or personal reasons for not doing so. Some who have reported FWB relationships note that they value the sexual activity with their friend, and many feel that it actually brings the relationship closer. Despite, despite valuing the sexual activity, they also report fears that it will lead to hurt feelings or the dissolution of a friendship. Again, it is exciting. We must also consider gender differences and communication challenges in FWB relationships. Gender biases must be considered when discussing heterosexual FWB relationships, given that women in most societies are judged more harshly than men for engaging in casual sex. But aside from dealing with the double standard that women face regarding their sexual activity, there aren't many gender differences in how men and women engage and perceive FWB relationships. Friends with benefits, by the way. So what communicative patterns are unique to the FWB relationship? Those who engage in FWB relationships have some unique communication challenges. For example, they may have difficulty with labels as they figure out whether they are friends, close friends, a little more than friends, and so on. Research participants currently involved in such relationship reported that they have more commitment to the friendship than the sexual relationship. But does that mean they would give up the sexual aspect of the relationship to save the friendship? The answer is no, according to the research study. Most participants reported that they would like the relationship to stay the same, followed closely by the hope that it would turn into a full romantic relationship. Again, it gives citing for 2011. Just from this study, we can see that there is often a tension between action and labels. In addition, those in an FWB relationship often have to engage in privacy management as they decide who to tell and who not to tell about their relationship. Given that some mutual friends are likely to find out, some may be critical of the relationship. Last, they, they may have to establish ground rules for, or guidelines for their relationship, since many friends with benefit relationships are not exclusive, meaning partners are open to having sex with other people. Ground rules or guidelines may include discussion of safer sex practices, disclosure of sexual partners, or periodic testing, the sexually transmitted infections. The lifespan of friendships. Friendships, like most relationships, have a lifespan ranging from formation to maintenance to deterioration, dissolution. Friendships have various turning points that affect their trajectory. While there are developmental stages in friendships, they may not be experienced linearly, as friends can cycle 
through formation, maintenance, and deterioration of dissolution together or separately and may experience stage, stages multiple times. Friends are also diverse in that all, not all friendships develop the same level of closeness. And the level of closeness can fluctuate over the course of a friendship. Changes in closeness can be ex an expected and accepted part of the cycle of friendships. And less closeness doesn't necessarily lead to less satisfaction. Again, Johnson, 2003. The formation process of friendship development involves two people moving from strangers toward acquaintances and potentially friends. Several factors influence the formation of friendships, including environment, situational, individual, and interactional factors. There's another quote, uh, fair. Environmental factors lead us to have more day-to-day -day contact with some people over others. For example, residential proximity and sharing a workplace are catalysts for friendship formation. Thinking back to your childhood, you may have had early friendships with people on your block because they were close by and you could spend time together easily without needing transportation. A similar situation may have occurred later if you moved away from home for college and lived in a residence hall. You may have formed early friendships, perhaps even before classes started, with hallmates or dormmates. I've noticed that many students will continue to associate, maybe even attempt to live close by to friends they made in their first residence hall throughout their college years, even as they move residence halls or off campus. We also find friends through the social network of existing friends and family. Although these people may not live close to us, they are brought into proximity to people we know, which facilitates our ability to spend time with them. Encountering someone due to environmental factors may lead to a friendship if the situational factors are favorable. The main situational factor that may facilitate or impede friendship formation is availability. Initially, we are more likely to be interested in a friendship if we anticipate that we'll be able to interact with the other person again in the future without expecting more effort than our schedule and other obligations will allow. In order for a friendship to take off, both parties need resources such as time and energy to put into it. Hectic work schedules, family obligations, or personal stresses such as financial problems or family or relational conflict may impair someone's ability to nurture a friendship. The number of friends we have at any given point is a situational factor that also affects whether or not we are actually looking to add new friends. I have experienced this fluctuation. Since I stayed in at the times uh, in the same city for my bachelor's master's degree, I had forged many important friendships over those seven years. In the last year of my master's program, I was immersed in my own classes and jobs as a residence hall director and teaching assistant. I was also preparing to move within a year to pursue my doctorate. I recall telling a friend of many years that I was no longer accepting applications for new friends. Although I was half joking, this example illustrates the importance of environmental <laughs> and situational factors. Not only was I busier than I had ever been, I was planning on moving and therefore knew it wouldn't be easy to continue investing in any friendships I made in my final year. Instead, I focused on the friendships I already had and attended to my other personal obligations. Of course, when I moved to the new city a few months later, I was once again accepting applications because I had lost the important physical proximity to all my previous friends. Environmental and situational factors that relate to a friendship formation point in the fact that convenience plays a large role in determining whether a relationship will progress or not. While contact and availability may initiate communication with a potential friend, individual and interactional factors are also important. We are more likely to develop friendship with individuals we deem physically attractive, socially competent, and responsive to our needs. Specifically, we are more attracted to people we deem similar or slightly above us in terms of attractiveness and competence. Although physical attractiveness is more important in romantic relationships, research shows that we evaluate attractive people more positively, which may influence our willingness to invest more in a friendship.
Friendships also tend to form between people with similar demographic characteristics, such as race, gender, age, and class, and similar personal characteristics like interests and values. Being socially competent and responsive in terms of empathy, emotion management, conflict management, and self-disclosure also contribute to the likelihood of friendship development. And I think this is important. And it's why, you know, I feel sometimes the need, and it could be circumstances like, uh, you know, a tragedy happens, or, you know, you're arguing with a friend. And it's, you know, important uh, that interests like values, being socially competent and responsive in terms of empathy, emotion management, conflict management, and self-disclosure. Uh, you know, I think we... You know, we tend to become too comfortable, um, and, you know, we hold things back, maybe, and we, sometimes we even fool ourselves with this stuff. I'll continue. If a friendship is established in the formation phase, then the new friends will need to maintain their relationship. The maintenance phase includes the most variation in terms of the processes that take place. The commitment to maintenance from each party and the length of time that the phase, in short, some friendships require more maintenance in terms of shared time together and emotional support than other friendships that can be maintained with only occasional contact. Maintenance is important because friendship provides important opportunities for social support that take the place or supplement family and romantic relationships. Sometimes we may feel more comfortable being open with a friend about something than we would with a family member or romantic partner. Most people expect that friends will be there for them when needed, which is the basis of friendship maintenance. As with other friendships, tests that help maintain friendships range from being there in a crisis to seemingly mundane day-to-day -day activities and interactions. Failure to perform or respond to friendship maintenance tests can lead to the deterioration and eventual dissolution of friendships. Causes of dissolution may be voluntary, Termination due to conflict, involuntary, death of a friendship partner, external, increased family or work commitments, or internal, decreased likely due to perceived lack of support. While there are often multiple interconnecting causes that result in friendship dissolution, there are three primary sources of conflict in a friendship that stem from inter internal, interpersonal causes and may lead to voluntary dissolution, sexual interference, Failure to support and betrayal of trust. Sexual interference generally involves a friend engaging with another friend's romantic partner, or romantic interest that can lead to feelings of betrayal, jealousy, and anger. Failure to support may entail a friend not coming to another's aid or defense when criticized. Betrayal of trust can stem from failure to secure private information by telling a secret or disclosing personal information without permission. While these three internal factors may initiate a conflict in a friendship, discovery of unfavorable personal traits can also lead to problems. Have you ever started investing in a friendship only to find out later that the person has some character flaws that you didn't notice before? As was mentioned earlier, we are more likely to befriend someone whose personal qualities we find attractive. However, we might not get to experience that person in a variety of contexts and circumstances before we invest in a friendship. We may later find out that our easygoing friend becomes really possessive once we start a romantic relationship and spend less time with him. Or we may find that our happy-go-lucky friend gets moody and irritable when she doesn't get her way. These individual factors become interactional when our newly realized dissimilarity affects our communication. It is logical that as our liking decreases as a result of personal reassessment of the friendship, we will engage in less friendship maintenance tests, such as self-disclosure and support communication. In fact, research shows that the main termination strategy employed to end a friendship is avoidance. As we withdraw from the relationship, the friendship fades away and may eventually disappear, which is distinct from romantic relationships, which have an official breakup. Aside from changes based on personal characteristics, discovered through communication. Changes in the external factors that can help friendship can also lead to the dissolution. The main change in environmental factors that can lead to friendship dissolution is a loss of proximity, 
which may entail a large or small geographical move or school or job change. The two main situational changes that affect friendship are schedule changes and changes in romantic relationships. Even without change in environment, someone's job or family responsibilities may increase, limiting the amount of time one has to invest in friendships. Additionally, becoming invested in a romantic relationship may take away from time previously allocated to friends. For my environmental and situational changes, the friendship itself is not the cause of the dissolution. The external factors are sometimes difficult, if not impossible, to control. And lost or faded friendships are a big part of everyone's relational history. I think that is so important. It's, sometimes it's not anyone's fault. You know, someone's busy, you know, give them time, let them work out things. You know, it um, doesn't matter if you're right or wrong, if their feelings matter. You, you make them feel a certain way, gotta let them have time and get through it, and maybe it won't change because there are external factors, and it's not anyone's fault. Friendships across the lifespan. As we transition between life stages such as adolescence, young adulthood, emerging adulthood, middle age, and later life, our friendships change in many ways. Our relationships begin to deepen in adolescence as we negotiate the confusion of puberty. Then in early adulthood, many people get to explore their identities and diversity of their friendship circle. Later, our lives stabilize and we begin to rely more on friendships with a romantic partner and continue to nurture the friendships that have lasted. Let's now learn more about the characteristics of friendships across the lifespan. Adolescence. Adolescence begins with one's puberty and lasts throughout teen years. We typically make our first voluntary close relationships during adolescence as cognitive and emotional skills develop. At this time, our friendships are usually with others of the same age, grade, in school, gender, and race, and friends typically have similar attitudes about academics and similar values. These early friendships allow us to test our interpersonal skills which affect the relationships we will have later in life. For example, emotional processing, empathy, self-disclosure, and conflict become features of adolescent friendships in new ways and must be managed. Adolescents begin to see friends rather than parents as providers for social support. As friends negotiate the various emotional problems often experienced for the first time. This new development, this new dependence on friendships can also create problems. For example, an adolescent's progress through puberty and forward on their identity search, they may experience some jealousy and possessiveness in their friendships as they attempt to balance the tensions between the dependence on and independence from friends. Additionally, an adolescent's articulate, articulate their identities. They look for acceptance and validation of self with their friends, especially given the increase in self-consciousness experienced by most adolescents. Those who do not form satisfying relationships during this time may miss out on opportunities for developing communication competence, leading to lower performance at work or school and higher rates of depression. The transition to college marks a move from adolescence to early adulthood and opens new opportunities for friendship and challenges in dealing with the separation from hometown friends. Early adulthood. Early adulthood encompasses the time from around 18 to 29 years of age. And although not every, not every person in this age group goes to college, most of the research on early, on early adult friendship focuses on college students. Those who have the opportunity to head to college will likely find a canvas for exploration and experimentation with various life and relationship choices, relatively free from the emotional, time, and financial constraints of starting their own family that may come later in life. As we transition from adolescence to early adulthood, we are still formulating our understanding of relational processes. But people report that their friendships are more intimate than the ones they had back in adolescence. During this time, friends provide important feedback on self-concept, careers, romantic or sexual relationships, and civic, social, political, and extracurricular activities. It is inevitable that young adults will lose some ties to their friends from adolescence during this transition, which has positive and negative consequences. 
Investment in friendships from adolescence provides a sense of continuity during the often rough transition to college. These friendships may also help set standards for future friendships, meaning the old friendships are a base for comparison for new friends. Obviously, this is a beneficial situation relative to the quality of old friendships. If the old friendship was not a healthy one, using it as a standard for a new friendship is a bad idea. Additionally, mer- uh, nurturing older friendships at the expense of meeting new people and experiencing new social situations may impede personal growth during this period. Adulthood Adult friendships spend a larger period of time than previous life stages discussed. And adulthood encompasses the period from 30 to 65 years old. The exploration that occurs for most middle class people in early adulthood gives way to less opportunity for friendship in adulthood, as many in this period settle into careers, nourish long-term relationships, and have children of their own. These new aspects of life bring more time constraints and interpersonal and task obligations. And with these new obligations come an increased desire for stability and continuity. Adult friendships tend to occur between people who are similar in terms of career, position, race, age, partner status, class, and educational level. This is partly due to the narrow social networks people join as they become more educated and attain higher career positions. Therefore, finding friends through religious affiliation, neighborhood work, or civic engagement is likely to result in a similarity between friends. Even as social networks narrow, adults are more likely than young adults to rely on their friends to help them process thoughts and emotions related to their partnerships or other interpersonal relationships. For example, a person may rely on a romantic partner to help process through work relationships, and close co-workers can help process through family relationships. Work and home life become connected in important ways. As career, money-making, intersects with and supports the desires for stability, homemaking. Since home and career are primary focuses, socializing outside those areas may be limited to interactions with family, parents, siblings, and in-laws. If they are geographically close, in situations where family isn't close by adults, close or best friends may adopt kinship roles. And as a child may say, may call a parent, close friend, Uncle Andy, even if they are not related. Spouses or partners are expected to be friends. It is often expressed that their best partner is one who can also serve as best friend. And having a partner as a best friend can be convenient if time outside the home is limited by parental responsibilities. There is not much research on friendships in the late Middle Ages, 50 to 65. But it has been noted that relationships with partners may become even more important during this time. As parenting responsibilities diminish with grown children and careers and finances stabilize, partners who have successfully navigated their middle age may feel a bonding sense of accomplishment with each other and with any close friends with whom they share these experiences. Later life. Friendships in later life, adulthood, which begins in one's 60s, often Remnants of previous friends with friendship patterns. Those who have typically had a gregarious social life will continue to associate with friends, if physically and mentally able. And those who relied primarily on a partner, family, or limited close friends will have more limited, but perhaps equally rewarding interactions. Friendships that have extended from adulthood or earlier often old or best friendships that offer a look into a dyad shared past. Given that geographical relocation is common in early adulthood, these friends may be physically distant, but if investment in occasional contact or visits preserve the friendship, these friends are likely to pick up where they left off. However, biological aging and the social stereotypes and stigma associated with later life and aging begin to affect communication patterns. Obviously, our physical and mental abilities affect our socializing, and activities may vary widely from person to person and age to age. Mobility may be limited due to declining health, and retiring limits to social interactions one had at work and work-related events. Perhaps uh, people may continue to work and lead physically and socially active lives decades past the marker of later life. 
which occurs around age 65. Regardless of when these changes begin, if the common and normal for our opportunities to interact wide friendship circles to diminish as our abilities decline. Early later life may be marked by a transition to partial or full retirement if a person is social economically privileged enough to do so. For some, retirement is a time to settle into a quiet routine in the same geographical place, perhaps becoming even more involved in hobbies and civic organizations, which may increase social interaction and the potential for friendships. Others may move to a more desirable place or climate and go through the process of starting over with new friends. For health and personal reasons, some in later life live assisted living facilities. Later life adults in these facilities may make friends based primarily on proximity, just as many college and early adulthood do in a similarly age-segregated environment of a residence hall. Friendships in later life provide emotional support that is often only applicable during this life stage. For example, given the generation, the general stigma against aging and illness, friends may be able to shield each other from negative judgments from others and help each other maintain a positive self-concept. Friends can also be instrumental in providing support after the death of a partner. Men, especially, may need this type, may need this type of support, as men are more likely than women to consider their spouse as their sole confidant, which means the death of a wife may end a later life man's most important friendship. Women who lose a partner also go through considerable life changes, and in general, more women are left single after the death of a spouse than men due to men's shorter lifespan and the tendency for men to be a few years older than their wives. Given this fact, it's not surprising that widows in particular may turn to other single women for support. Overall, providing support in later life is important given the likelihood for declining health. In the case of declining health, some may turn to family instead of friends for support and to avoid overburdening friends with requests of assistance. However, turning to a friend for support is not completely burdensome, as research shows that feeling needed helps other people maintain a positive well-being. Gender and Friendship Gender influences our friendship, friendships and has received much attention as people try to figure out how different men and women's friendships are. There is a concept, there's a conception that men's friendships are less intimate than women's based on the stereotype that men do not express emotion. In fact, men report a similar amount of intimacy in their friendships as women, but are less likely than women to explicitly express affection verbally, i.g., you know, saying I love you, and non-verbally, by touching or embracing, towards their same gender friends. This is not surprising given the social taboos against same gender expressions of affection, especially between men. Even though an increasing number of men are more comfortable expressing affection toward other men and women, however, researchers have wondered if men communicate affection in more implicit ways that are still understood by other friends. Many may use shared activities as a way to express closeness, for example, by doing favors for each other engaging in friendly competition, joking, sharing resources, or teaching each other new skills. Some scholars have argued that there is a bias toward viewing intimacy as feminine, which may have skewed research on men's friendships, while verbal expression of intimacy through self-disclosure have been noted as important features of a woman's friendships. Activity sharing has been the focus of men's friendships. Well, wow, that's interesting. Important feature of women's friendships activity. Uh, activity sharing has been the focus of men's friends. The re this research doesn't argue that one's gender friendships are better than the other, and it concludes that the difference shown in research regarding expression of intimacy are not large enough to impact the actual practice of friendship. Cross gender friendships. Our friendships between male and a female. These friendships diminish in late childhood and early adolescence as boys and girls segregate into separate groups for many activities and socializing, reemerge as possibilities in late adolescence, and reach a peak potential in the college years of early adulthood. Later, adults with spouses or partners are less likely to have cross-sex friendships than single people. In any case, research studies have identified several positive outcomes of cross-gender friendships. Men and women report they get a richer understanding of how the other gender thinks and feels. 
It seems these friendships fulfill interaction needs not as commonly met in same-gender relationships. For example, men reported more than women that they rely on cross-gender friendships for emotional support. Similarly, women reported that they enjoyed the activity-oriented friendships they had with men. As discussed earlier regarding friends with benefits, relationships, sexual attraction presents a challenge in cross-gender heterosexual friendships. Even if the friendship does not include sexual feelings or actions, outsiders may view the relationship as sexual or even encourage the friends to become more than friends. Aside from the pressures that come with sexual involvement or tension, the exaggerated perceptions of differences between men and women can hinder cross-gender friendships. However, if it were true that men and women are too different to understand each other or be friends, then how could any long-term partnership such as a husband, wife, mother, son, father, daughter, or brother, sister be successful or enjoyable? So that's it. Um, there's uh, a key takeaways. Friendships are voluntary. Interpersonal relationships between two people who are usually equals. Or friendships formation, maintenance, and deterioration, dissolution are influenced by environmental, situational, and interpersonal factors. Friendships change throughout our lives as we transition from adolescence to adulthood to later life. Cross-gender friendships may offer pers perspective into gender relationships. That same gender friendships do not as both men and women report that they get support e enjoyment from their cross-gender friendships. However, there is a potential for sexual tensions that complicate the relationship. So there we go. We got through it. I didn't flub up too much. Um, again, this is a dry read from an academic book. It's um, communication in the real world. It can help in all general ways. It, like I said, chapter one is an introduction. Two is communication perception. Then we got verbal communication, nonverbal communication, listening, interpersonal. Like, and I'm, I read chapter 7.2, which is communication and friends. But it can give you a lot of information on everything in general, um, leadership roles, problem solving in groups, media technology. So maybe it's an interest to everybody. And in the more important factor in my life, can I grow as a friend? Can I learn new things? Can I tell all my friends right now that I love them? And I am here. If you ever need to talk, don't feel weird or funny. I want to apologize for any way I made anyone feel, whether it was wrong or I was right. I love you all. And thank you for being a part of my life. And despite my beliefs, I, be I do believe that everybody who interacts and has something to do with each other in some way becomes a part of that person. And I try to do my own meditation and stuff, and I look for the aspects of myself that are you, that make me a better person. So, again, I love you all. If you're here, you can just get in touch with me. I'll talk to you all later. Bye-bye.